Consuming. Hey, this is Nomad, host and creator of the Career Musician Podcast. Why do they call me Nomad? Well, I traveled the globe, spreading the joy of music one song at a time. And now I bring you wisdom, tried and true knowledge, and life experiences of my colleagues and peers in this crazy business we call music. All right, today's episode on the Career Musician Podcast features Derek D.O.A. Allen, bass player and producer extraordinaire. This is the Career Musician Podcast with your host, Nomad. We all know how it is. Flying on private jets, staying at world-class resorts and places all around the globe, performing nightly in the world's biggest arenas, for tens of thousands of screaming fans, starting with Janet Jackson and the Rhythm Nation Tour. What? Come on, folks. That's some heavy stuff right there. Then Lionel Richie. But wait, there's more. He got tired of the road and he said, you know what? I'm taking it to the studio. Now he's producing gold and platinum records for everybody, namely of late Mr. Kem. If you've heard Kem's music, then you've heard DOA's work, and it just starts there. That's only the beginning, folks. Take a listen to what DOA has to tell us about his path in this crazy biz. We did the Rhythm Nation tour with Janet, and after that tour was over, you were on the biggest tour in the world, you know, at that time. 89, 90. 89, 90. Black Cat, Rhythm, Rhythm, Rhythm Nation. The whole thing. <laughs> Black Cat, the Rhythm Nation, yeah. the whole thing. So after the tour was over, man, I said, okay, what, what, where do I go from here? I had just, before Janet, I was playing with Karen White. Right. And Superwoman. Superwoman when yeah. she was, you know, Love she Saw it and the whole, all the Babyface records. I would say the Babyface. Sure, color. sure. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so after, after the tour, my thing was, okay, well, you know, Michael Jackson had his band on lock, you know, the, the, the next big artist you, you think you can go play with, right, was, was not available because everybody, everybody had their bands, right? So with me, it was like, uh, you know, let me get off into the production. Let me try to... At, you know, try to write some songs, you know. Mm. Didn't know anything about production, studio, none of that. Mm. Go to the studio paying fifty dollars an hour to an engineer, you know what I mean? Paying fifty dollars an hour to an engineer at the time. Then the next thing you know is like, you know, there's no gigs. So now I'm just going to the studio trying to write. So I'm in the studio, man, writing these songs that I think that I'm thinking are great songs. I got this one song that you know how you write a song, you say, Oh man. Oh man, this song could be for such and such. You get excited. If, yeah. if such and such, here it is, right? It's gonna be over with, right? But I had that. That was me. I had a song for Bobby Brown okay. that I knew that was a hit for Bobby Brown in my own mind, in my own world, it was a hit. Okay. Right. But the problem was I didn't have no connection. How do you I had get conne- it to Bobby. Yeah. Here, and here's what's funny because when I was out with Karen, we opened up for the Don't Be Cool tour mm-hmm. with Bobby Brown, Levert. So I was seeing that, that tour lasted like almost two years. It was a long tour. It lasted quite a while. So I would see Bobby in passing, right? We would see each other. He would he would always come up to me, talk, and we you know we kick it small talk, but no phone numbers, no connection, right? Mm-hmm. So then when I did Janet, Bobby was showing up to a lot of the places just to hang out, hang out, trying to be close to Janet. So Bobby would see me. So then I get to talk to him, talk to Tommy. You know, he was kind of hanging out. Unwantingly, you know, he they, they didn't want him, he just showing up, right? <laughs> yeah. So now I'm in the studio working on this song, I had no clue how I was gonna get this song to Bobby. And I promise you, man, the next day I go to the studio, the phone rings, it's for me, it's Tommy Brown calling me, Bobby Brown's brother calling me, looking for me. Wow. He said, you know, Bobby's going to Japan, he's been looking for you for the longest, he wants to know, are you available? to play bass in Japan, and he will take care of you, yada, yada. So I'm looking at the phone, I'm like, quite as kept, dude, I will do this gig for free, just so I can get my song, yeah, your song to in him hand. in his hand, right? Yes. So it was, just, it was just, it was nothing but the angels, nothing but the destiny, it was just crazy. Divine, yeah, yeah. Divine, man, absolutely. So about a couple of weeks later, I fly to Atlanta. I'm in rehearsals with Bobby. 
Now I got my song on the cassette. I got this song burning my burning the <laughs> hole in your <laughs> right, it burning a complete hole in my pocket, bro. You hear me, man? Exactly. This this tape was burning a hole in my pocket, and but it was like I didn't have the nerve to let Bobby know I had a song. You know, I didn't know if the song was good or bad or anything. So it was like me you know, when we were younger. You know, and you see that you're in know, elementary school. You say you see a girl, you like. Oh, I'm gonna talk to her tomorrow. Then Friday comes, oh, I'm gonna do it on Monday. Mm-hmm. So you know it, it's the end of the year. You never talk to her till, you know what I'm saying? It was that kind of nerve, right? So there was the right time came. We were on a break, Bobby was in the room, I'm in the room, he's talking. He says, yo D, man, I'm so glad you're here. You know, man, you were killing, you know, Janet, man, oh man, you know, you were killing him. You know, and he asked about Janet, how's Renee? And yeah, I said, dude, you know, you almost got me fired, man. You was acting crazy on that, you harassing Janet. Then you come, give me love, and everybody looking at you. Like we were buddies, and they looking at me like, yeah, you, that's your friend, why is your friend, you know? So we laughed about it. And so I, so I asked him what he was doing. He says, man, working on my album. He says, after rehearsals, I go to the studio. I said, so I'm like, okay, you're working on your record, you know? I said, How, how's it going, you know? Mm. He said, man, it's going cool, you know, working with Babyface, working with Teddy. And says, he says, um, he says, why? Do you, you know, do you have something? Damn. He says, he says, and I says, uh, you know, by all means. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, says, I says, you know, I, I do, he says, I do have some. He says, well, you know, when can I hear it, you know? I says, well, you know, I, I got it right with now. me. You know, he said, he, he said, man, got a walk, man. Opportunity yeah. meets preparation. Exactly. That he was says, the era, no, right? Yeah, that was the era. But he had his car outside. Okay. Right? Yeah. He says, man, let's go to the car. Let's check it out. That's dope. So I'm like tripping, right? So I got this song. It's called "I Need a Girl." I didn't know if the song was any good or anything. I didn't know what what I was doing. So I knew that I was trying to sound like Bobby Brown, the demo, and trying to yeah. put the Bobby Brown thing on it, right? So we get in the car, he's playing, he puts the cassette in, he's playing the cassette, his speakers is loud enough to just shake a, <laughs> shake a, down the building. Mm. About 30, 40 seconds in, he stops the tape, and I was like, oh, he doesn't like it, right? He rolls the windows down to the car, he calls the band, security, dancers, everybody around to the car yelling, and he says, you guys need to come and listen to my next single for my album. And I'm in the driver's seat like this, right? I'm like, I'm like, you know, I'm tripping out. So now oh. everybody comes around. Everybody's come around, right? And, 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 and they're dancing. And I'm like, wow, man, I, th- I think I got a cool song. So now he says, he says, D, we're going to go to Japan. After we leave Japan, I'm going to fly you back to Atlanta and we're going to record not only this song, but I want to record another one with you, right? So, 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 so I'm like tripping, right? So now I'm in Japan, getting ready, you know, to do these two shows. I'm playing bass and I'm, I'm making some cool money. I'm making maybe like, like three grand or something, you know, something like that for just to go over and play a show, right? So, so then I get a call from... His his uh, his ma- his uh, 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 business manager is a lady, and she says, "Yeah, Mr. Allen, just giving you the particulars on your trip back to Atlanta. You're gonna go to Atlanta. You're, you're gonna be staying where you are. You guys are gonna be there for two weeks, working at Boss Town, working on two songs for Mr. Brown's new album. And um, Mr. Brown has agreed to pay you fifteen thousand dollars." So I'm looking, yeah, I'm, I'm like, so I said, uh, and you, and, and then he says, then he says, and you're doing two songs, right? I says, yeah, two songs. I said, wait a minute. I said, hold on. What do you mean? That's not how the He's going to pay me $15,000? I said, he's going to give me $15,000 for my songs? And then she got irritated. She says, listen, if you... He's gonna pay you fifteen thousand dollars per per song. You're doing two songs. That's thirty thousand dollars. If you have a problem, you know, let me know so I can take it up with Mr. Brown. I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I said, no. You don't understand. I'm, I'm, there's no problem. There's there's not a problem. Totally, I'm totally cool with that. I was blown away. So my first production, couldn't believe it. Two songs. Fifteen thousand dollars a piece. Each. That's thirty thousand dollars. So I said then to myself, I'm in the wrong business. 
there's something's wrong with right, the business because you're in. looking at the money you're making on the gig, looking at the money what you're doing to in the it, studio. It, exactly. And at that time, that's when you can make that kind of money. You know, at that time, yeah. the guys was making twenty, thirty, forty thousand a track, a hundred thousand, yeah. so on and so forth. Right. So here I am. Nobody, never even. I don't do it. I'm not. I don't have a clue what I'm doing, man. So he's paying you fifteen to produce the songs. Fifteen so he to thousand. Buy the records. But he's not buying the songs. You still have. You still retain your writers. Well, see, to me, there's no such thing as buying a record. There's never okay. that 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 language never exists Thank because you. because you never give up your publishing your Amen. rights to okay. the record. Okay. So they're paying okay. you a Amen. fee for the record. Amen. Okay. They're paying you a fee. They so there was a producer's fee, fee. Producer's fee. Everybody hear that. Everybody hear yeah. what DOA just yeah. said. <laughs> there's no such thing as buying beats. Man. That's right. That, I hate That's when people amen. because That's because right. there's been a lot of people that just got ganked for that. Especially a lot of young rap producers, young cats, beat yeah. makers. They give a. a, 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 a a drug label hundred dollars for a beat and they take it and they think they own it and they put oh, their name man. on it, take their publishing and so yeah, it was the producer's fee. Right? But that's so beautiful. You got your producer's fee, got you got producer's your writers, fee. your publishing publishing everything. And so so we come back, we go to do the record, we in the studio, we're working, we record this record, I need a girl and Bobby sounded amazing on it. Then we write this other song. It was crazy. We write this other song called College Girl. Right, so we the college girl was the name of the other song, but on I Need a Girl. Now, mind you, man, I ain't never produced nobody, mm. I don't know what the SSL, mm. I don't know, uh, I just know this guy's engineer. He's, I know what I want to hear. I'm like, can you make this brighter? Can you turn sure. the kick drum up? That's that, that was that's all I knew. So, Bobby is in the studio singing, he says, Damn, I'm gonna take a break, I gotta run to the airport and get my girl. It's gonna be about an hour. He said, by the way, do you want my girl to sing on the record? I'm like, you know, who's your girl, you know? He said, dude, you know my girl, man. Come on, man, do you, I get her to sing on the record. I said, dude, who's your girl? He said, Whitney. I said, Whitney who? <laughs> he said, dude, Whitney Houston, man, you know that's my girl? I said, get, get the heck out of here, dude. <laughs> he says, dude, do you want her to sing? I said, man, you ain't messing with no Whitney. Get out of here. He said, man, I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> an hour later, an hour later, an hour later, so he cool. walks in the room with Whitney Houston, and they were really, really booed up together. Gotcha. And I'm looking like, you've got to be kidding me right now. Right? <laughs> so they do their thing, come in. He, he says, so yeah, babe, this is you know this is DOA. He got you. I'm gonna take off. I'm gonna go get some food. I'll be right back. Right. She's like, okay, cool. So she goes into the to the booth, take her jacket off, put her headphones on, and I'm looking at the engineer like, what the hell is about to happen right now? <laughs> what, what's, what's, what's going on? What's happening? This is Whitney Houston. Dude. You gotta produce her vocals. <laughs> there you go, right? <laughs> you gotta start stacking BGVs to start. Oh, no. <laughs> Let's so, start there. <laughs> so, so what was funny is she's getting the mic ready and everything, and, she, and she's looking around, she says, all right, D, what am, what am I doing? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> oh, seriously, dude. Yeah. I was like, I said, um, you just go sing, right? Just sing? She started, she said, look, just, just play the music. Just play the track. Dude, I'm telling you, now I'm sitting in my first production working with Whitney Houston. With Bobby Brown. With Bobby Houston. Brown. Whitney Houston, Bobby Brown. And this is before Lionel. This was well this is before, before Lionel. Lionel. So he, he's, he planted seeds. Way before. This was well before Lionel. This was well before Lionel. And what was ironic, guys, this is crazy, man. And, you know, I'm glad I'm sharing this because this is really like my real t testimony. I got two of them, but this is my testimony. You know, when it was all said and done, you know, when you do a record, it's never really, get, I didn't know that then, but, you know, you're not really guaranteed to make the album. They recorded 50 records, right? Yeah. So I didn't know that then, but I know I got paid, you know? Sure. And, it was crazy because one of the songs made the album and it wasn't my first song. It was the second oh, song we wrote. It was College Girl. Look at that. Right? But when the album, when people found out that I was on this album with Teddy Riley and Babyface uh, and all this, guess what was happening? My phone was ringing. Phone blown, blown up. Before the record even came out. And the reason why, because Bobby had just come off of Don't Be Cruel. Don't Be Cruel sold 12, 15, 20 million records, this is right? Critical. right? So everybody's thinking that the next record was gonna, you know, mm -hmm. do just as well or do halfway as good, right? So not only were people thinking about that, but 
you know, in the industry was watching this guy's right? Industry expectations are high. It's really high, right? Yeah. So, so I get this call from a friend of mine. He says, yo, D, man, you know, dude, you know, you can get a publishing deal. I said, okay, so what's a publishing deal? Mm-hmm. So now he's explaining what a publishing deal would be, right? So we talked for a couple of weeks. Finally, a couple of weeks later, I went to L.A., got with my boy. He had about three or four meetings set up with right, these publishing companies. Mm-hmm. They're bringing this guy in who's got two songs on the Bobby Brown album. You know, this is DOA, he's got two songs. Never produced nobody, don't have a clue, right? So we went to this last place and we meet this brother. And his brother was named James Leach. You guys know James? Okay. Brother was at this company named James Leach. So I played them the Michael Jackson songs, I mean, uh, the uh, Bobby Brown songs. And, and and I play him a couple of other songs, just some demos, right? But they're really interested in them two Bobby Brown songs because I got 50% of the publishing. So this is what yeah, attracted they want anybody. Your publishing. Exactly. Yeah, that's what they want. So they want to give me some money publishing. So my dude was saying you can do a publishing deal, write 10 songs a year, and get maybe, you know, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars. I'm like, yeah, maybe, yeah. Hey, dude, for real, for I can write, that's all I gotta do. Just so I didn't know nothing about it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he hears the music, he likes the music. He says, Man. You gotta meet my boss, right? But can you come back tomorrow? So we go back the next day. So when I get there, his boss comes in. He says, I don't need to hear anything. I heard it through the walls yesterday. And we wanna sign you over here, but we don't have a final say so. We have a boss that has a final say so, and he has to hear the music. So can you get us these two songs? and maybe like three or four of your strongest songs that you have, right? So now I'm kind of tripping out. We leave. I said, dude, my boy. I was like, man, where are we? Who, what are we doing? What are we doing? What's the end game? He says, D, you have no clue. Mm-hmm. He said, man, we are at ATV. Uh, I said, okay, so what's ATV? Sony ATV. No. Before I had Sony to pick them up. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. He says, dude, I said, what's ATV? Mm. He says, man, this is Michael Jackson's yeah. company. Mm-hmm. If they if they want to give your music to Michael Jackson, yeah. he said, stop lying. <laughs> he said, yeah, they're going to give it to Michael. And if Michael likes it, he's going to sign you. Two weeks later, I was had a deal with ATV. Mm. That was, that, that's how. So And then that's when I went out and bought a house. Yes. Because you now I got like, like a two-year deal, yeah. right? And I'm still touring. You have an income stream. I got an income. That's the correct word. I got an income stream that's really, really nice. That's legit. That's, young, that's legit. That's legit. I just didn't take, you know, whatever I made from Janet, bought a house and, did, you, know, I, you know. So now I got at least a two-year income stream that's guaranteed. Yeah. Plus I'm still touring, right? Yeah. And I'm still, I was very much torn, so I was doing both. Drummers! So you're watching an amazing drummer on YouTube, and they're playing something so crazy, you just can't figure it out. If only you can tap this drummer on the shoulder and say, hey, can you slow it down and break it down for me, man? PossibleChops.com does exactly that. They've asked some of the top of the line drummers to play in short, digestible phrases some of their craziest chops. Then they slow it down and transcribe it so you can actually learn what the heck they're doing. They're making chops possible. Now, PossibleChops.com is an online drum lesson website that makes it easy to add to your drumming vocabulary from some of the baddest professional drummers. And when I say baddest, I mean the dopest, illest, most ridiculousest drummers you ever heard. Imagine getting a breakdown from drummers who played with the likes of Usher, Earth, Wind & Fire, Chick Corea, Babyface, Sheryl Crow, Tony Braxton, and the list goes on. The PossibleChops.com community is designed to allow drummers to share ideas and help you on your path to becoming a pro and getting gigs. That's right, folks, actually getting real gigs. If you're serious about drumming, do yourself a favor and visit PossibleChops.com. Join today and basic membership is free. However, If you decide to upgrade to a pro membership, use the promo code NOMAD to get your first free month. 
That's right, folks. Use coupon code NOMAD and you get the whole first month absolutely free. Adding new chops are now made possible for drummers on possiblechops.com. Yeah. So, because after Janet, I think we did. I think I did went out with like the time or, or went, oh, wow. well, no, no. I went out with Bobby Brown after the album. I toured Bobby on the Bobby album, and then I asked Bobby because he was doing Europe, and I asked Bobby could I not do Europe because I wanted to focus on some of the production opportunities. Yeah. And he said cool. And then I got off into production, you know, doing some doing some stuff. I had a soundtrack on a couple of things with. Couple Tony 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 um, on a Poetic Justice record with Sadiq had a soundtrack had a couple of, group called Black Girl mm-hmm. group called Smooth Silk some underlying artists right mm-hmm. you know what I mean yeah. and then um, and then um, so I'm doing this stuff and then now I got a publishing deal as well so I'm now getting producers fees and got a publishing deal and, yeah. and and I'm off the road so then I decided to go back out with with with, uh, with TLC. Then we, then Chucky called me. We did new did new edition, and so but I'm still writing and getting songs. Now I got a couple of records. Like I got Tyrese lately up under my belt, right? Mm. That, that song did real well. Wow. And then I did Smokey Norfolk. I need you now record. Mm. That record did good. So you know, so I had some minor first, records. Yeah. yeah. You know, but still not enough. You know, the, the deal with Michael Jackson ran out, right? And then it renewed. I did the two years, okay. right? So that was it. That was it. That was the okay, one. Okay, so that was it. And then I did one year deal with with, um, with Polygram gave me a deal mm. for one year. It was cool. Yeah. But then I got another deal with Disney, so I was signed to Disney for five years. That's mm. so that's I signed good. A deal right? with, oh, it was great, man. It was great. I signed a deal with Disney for five years, and it was it was very cool. And that's when, for me, man, that's when I decided. To, and then things started to dry up after a while. At one while, you know, brother was making some really good money. I was probably like a, maybe for jazz, I think it was like 75 a record. For gospel, it was 10. Yeah. And for R&B, it was like 25 a record. You yeah. know? So that's kind of like where my status was. Yeah. And I was blessed to be able to do these different jobs. All these different, yeah. But the problem was, man, the problem was, was being a side man, dude. And then, you know, and then after a while, let me tell you, man, I got the Lionel gig, right? Chuckie called me for the Lionel gig. I had just bought a crib, just bought a house, a brand new house, right? Chuckie called me, offered me the job, and I had to think about it. I said, man, I don't know. You know, let me let me think about it. So, I'm like, you know, doing this gig, and I'm then I'm looking at this big old house. I'm like. What the heck am I thinking about? I better go pay for this I, house. Exactly. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. things were slow, drying yeah. up, you know. And So I only did the gig. But I did the gig thinking I was going to be able to sit with this dude, the greatest mm. songwriter in the world, and mm. get soak up some stuff, possibly write some records. Cultivate like you did with Bobby. Absolutely. I found out real quick That's not how that that would never, no. ever happen. And I found out the hard way. Mm. When I tell you, I found out the hard way that that was never gonna happen. Mm. It doesn't the, work the, like the, that. The situation you had with Bobby, like you said, was divine intervention, it was an anomaly. Exactly. That does not happen all the time. It, exactly, and we were completely, yeah, I built a friendship with Bobby. Right. We were friends, we were tight. Plus, Bobby was cut a whole different way. Mm. Right. So I finally figured out that, okay, dude, you know, you're here to play bass. Mm-hmm. That's all it's ever going to be. You know? And so I, I just kept it there. And now I'm, you know, and because we were gone so much, because we were gone so much, I tell you, man, after a while, you know, for me, the best part about the gig, I mean, it was a great gig, but I was miserable after a while, miserable on the gig. And my thing is this. I'm not going to be miserable playing the bass for nobody because I love it so much. Quasi right. is kept. I, I do the shit for free. That's how much I love it. Mm-hmm. But somebody going to pay me money and be crazy yeah. enough to pay me money, yeah. I'm going to take it. Well, we got, I'm, I'm not going to be miserable. If I'm going to be miserable, I'm going to go to Home Depot and get a job mm. or, 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 or Lowe's or, or 7-Eleven. You know? You're not going to be miserable Paul. picking up a guitar doing what you love that you would something you, you love to do. I've been there, when, bro. When it's, it's like that, the, that's, then and, you and, know. You're, and you're in the most exotic oh, places in, in the, the world. world. You're just, 
just you could be in Fiji, Maui, come on, Indonesia, come on. Absolutely. Amsterdam. You absolutely. could be living, if it's A- not right. Absolutely. And people are looking at you like, oh my gosh, dude, you're you just you're just so blessed. And yeah. we are. Yeah, yeah, but yes. at the end of the day, life don't end right there. There's no. other things that you know that you want to do. You, you know, you, you you still got a lot of life to live, and it don't stop with this. It's just so much more that Books I Books don't do. just have one chapter. Exactly. So so with me. <clears throat> You know, so that was a leap of faith that you took. I took a leap of faith, man. It was blind faith in one instance. Yes. But it wasn't faith without works because the work right. was you were networking. Absolutely. And creating, cultivating relationships. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. And, and that's what business is, Also, right? too, relationships. Keep it real. So everybody, you know, pretty much, you know, people are like now starting to don't even know I play bass. Right. People are, more people are starting to know me as a producer. A producer. Mm-hmm. And I wanted that. Yes. Because every, everybody always just knew me as a bass Amen. player. Amen. Yes. Yeah. Everybody just knew me as a bass player. That's what and I was, I was like, saying. you know, so what happened was I was on the gig for about the first four years and I got fired. I got fired from the gig. And the reason why was because I don't even know if Trey know, but the reason why we had just did a European run for like three and a half months, and um, I was in a position where, you know, I was like, you know, it's, I think it's time for I think it's time for a raise, you know, my my thing, you know, I think it's time I got, it's time for a raise. I, I want a raise. So before I could ask for the raise, right there, you're thinking like a businessman. Yes. Most yes. musicians don't do that. Most right. musicians will just stay and oh, yep. oh, I'm not saying a word. Don't say a I'm word. Just, you know. Yep. But you want growth. I want growth. Any position. Let's say you're an executive. Absolutely. You want growth. You have a right, right? You have a right, right? Oh, you have a yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, you do have a right to, to grow. You have a right <laughs> if you're working hard. Yeah, that's so funny the way you just asked me. I was like, yeah. hey, what are you asking me? I didn't get <laughs> it. But you have a right. You have a right. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> right. So so we get back, we get back, we on like maybe three and a half, four month tour, man, with Europe, you know. Yeah. Successful, we. I'm. I can count chairs. I know what kind of money. Right, I'm getting right. paid. You can see the house. <sighs> so I get back. So I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna get asked for my raise. And so I get. There's an email that come across. Everybody, we had a great year. Yada yada yada. Um, thanks for everybody for you know doing a good job. Whatever the email says, but unfortunately, there's gonna be a cut in pay. Oh, and coming up right. in the following year is going to be a cut and pay. Uh, we'll be in touch with everybody, and I'm like, cut and pay. Yeah, I'm supposed and to here I am, yeah. trying to ask for a raise. Mm. I said, no, no, I'm not doing that. I sent the email back, straight across, and my email read something like, "Hey, uh, you know, <laughs> it, said, it was something like, it, for real, it was like, hey, everybody, hope everybody's well. Um, actually." You caught me at a time when I was about to ask for a pay increase. So since everybody's doing bad after such a successful tour, I tell you what, for right now, I'll just stay where I am and pay. And I'll deal with my raise later. See, I, I got so an email back two minutes later. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mr. Allen, fortunately, you know, such such Mr. Richie will no longer be needing your services. Any references? I'm reading this email, I'm like, Got to be kidding, kidding me. You already knew, man. I knew, I knew, I knew it was coming, right? Yeah, yeah, you knew. It was inevitable. But here's what's ironic. Here's what's crazy. The very next day, my mom called me and said she got diagnosed with breast cancer. The very mm. next day, nothing else mattered. That's right. I would have been leaving the gig anyway, mm, or yeah. bringing a sub, or That's doing right. something, because immediately, it just broke Everybody That's there right. had to deal with mom, right? That's right. So we got to figure out what we, we got to do this to save my mother. Mm-hmm. So now we go through the process. Mom has a has a, has a tumor. Mm-hmm. She decides to have one of her breasts removed, and we go through the surgery. Surgery went good, but you're not out of the woods yet. Take right. take a little while, you know. So now I'm discovering I can get unemployment, right? right. So I go do the thing. I didn't have to go to the line. I didn't go to the unemployment right, right, office or nothing. Right, right. I, I did it from the from the crib yeah. and found out that I could make some. Like right. you mean, I can make this doing unemployment? Cool. <laughs> yeah. I'm straight, you know. Because you were on the. I was the on the gig. So I was long. on the gig for a while. And again, you paid it. What most cats don't know is that's, that's your money. Your money, exactly. You're paying into the government. Exactly. Anyway. <laughs> that's your money. So here's what happens. So we we <laughs> we go through we go through mom. And this is crazy. We go through the treatments. We go through everything. We go 
through. So they fired me to bring back the other cat before me, which was Don Boyette, right? They fired okay. me to bring back Don. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm replacing Don because they don't like the way he play, <laughs> right? right? But you gonna bring him back? Right. Really? Okay, cool. And, and this was not, this was the boss thing. This wasn't mm-hmm. nobody else thing. Yeah. Nobody, right? Mm-hmm. So we go through the treatment with my mother, man, at about, about maybe six, seven months. We fit, we get a good positive word that she, you know, they got the cancer. Everything was cool. So now we can breathe, right? right. Yeah. We, if we can finally yeah. breathe, I promise you, maybe a day, maybe two days later, Chucky calls me, <laughs> checking on mom. Yeah. He says, but D, I gotta talk to you. He says, man, shit's fucked up. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it ain't right. Yeah. So I'm like, oh yeah? Oh, yeah? You know, he says, sorry he, to hear that, bro. He, yeah, sorry to hear that, bro. <laughs> so then, then he says that, and he says, you know, we are, um, and we, you know, we can ready to do essence. This is the first year we've, it was the year that Luther had passed. Um, so now Chucky is like, D, Lionel's hitting me like, you know, Booker, what's going on with the groove? And he's like, dude, what are you talking about? What do you mean? You know, it's, it's just, you, you know, and you and, 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 and exactly. And he's like, and they had did some European stuff. They were working, yeah. you know. And Chuck was like, "Dude, we lost, we lost the cat. We lost you, the, you know, the base, you know." He says, "When whatever we gotta do, get D back." Yeah, Chuck, he calls me back. He calls me and he's telling me that you know they gotta do essence and it's got he can't Lionel can't go in there doing dance you know doing the the, the stuff we do in Europe with the right. with the rock stuff Dancing, he, he, he gotta shit. bring the funk out yeah, yeah, he gotta yeah. go back to the go back because to the Commodores yeah because we go back to the Commodores and it's gotta be funky it's gotta have some grease on it it's gotta yeah. have some grease on it and they know that he gotta go they gonna do the whole show they wanna Chucky wanna do his thing and put it together right, right? right. so he's reaching out to me says D man you know he needs you to come back. And, okay. you know, we, we need you, everybody needs you to come back. I said, well, you know what? I appreciate this, but I need to talk to Lionel straight up. He says, man, <laughs> call him up. He's, he, you know, he's, he, you know, you know, Lionel's type of cat don't like adversity. He don't. Right, he don't like, doesn't like he, the confrontation. He, he, he doesn't yeah. like confrontation. Yeah. So I'm like, no, mm-mm. I'm going to talk to my man. Yeah. So I calls him and, um, you know, he gave me that old DOA, hey, baby, hey, how you doing? Woo, give me that thing. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm just over here with Nicole, and we having some dinner, and, oh, the guys, you know, that's all he's talking about, all right? right? All right. I'm listening, so, he says, man, you know, to everybody, you know, Oscar can't, Oscar can't sleep at night, and he's doing his jokes and stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's doing his jokes and stuff, so I said, I said, okay, I said, that's cool, I said, it's good to know the guys want me back, but I need to know if 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 you want me back, mm. right? I know the guys want me back. I need to know. You're putting need, them in the hot seat, dude, on yeah. purpose. Yeah. I said I need to know if you want me back. I was like, he just then he yeah. then he gets really really serious. Cool. No, look here, brother. Look here. Let me <laughs> tell you something. Let me, let me here, son. Let me tell you something. <laughs> and he says, you know, D, you know, you know, I bullshit a lot of times. I bullshit a lot of people that I already knew, you know. I, I need you back. I want you back on this gig. You know, and whatever we gotta do to make it right, I want you to come back. So I said, well, I appreciate that. Consider it done. I said, but now, my other question is, what happened? Why did I get fired anyway? Well, you know, DOA Uh-oh, sometimes, you know, when I was with the Commodores, you know, we, we you know, when I was with the Commodores and we had some things that we used to do and we, we hurt. Then he said, man, you know what, I don't know. In circles. He says, I don't know. He says, but bruh. I said, well, listen, okay, I'm going to let you go. Before I was getting ready, before I got fired, I said, um, I had, I was, um, I think maybe it's because they did, y'all did the pay cut and I refused, you know. Said, there ain't no way I'm coming back for the same money. Right now. I got, you know. You, so I said, listen, you know, um, I can't come back for the same money. Now, mind you, everybody else. Shit went down. Right. So my thing is like, I, I definitely want to come back, but it's gonna to have to be like this. Pause. Hey man, call Loffler, call Randy, call whoever, and I'll make we'll make it happen. Cool. So I was back. 
All right. From transitioning those global stages to working with Bobby Brown, Janet Jackson, Lionel Richie, and everybody else in between, to signing huge publishing deals and negotiating contracts. That's right. All in a day's work of the career musician. Take heed to DOA's words. Trust me, folks. Learn the art of negotiating and acquire good business acumen. If you enjoyed today's interview, please subscribe and leave a review. How come when it comes cool. down to Queen Latifah, U-N-I-T-Y, that's a unity? Come on now. How come all of a sudden motherfuckers lose their balls? Come, come on, man. I don't get it. Why is that? I can't make it make sense for nothing, bro. The law of averages teaches us that the, the universal principles teach us there's power in numbers. Yes. If you come together as a unit of six or seven or Absolutely. Five and say, hey, well, this is what we want. We, yeah. We are here to make your show better. Absolutely. However. Absolutely, We're not man. giving you an ultimatum. Preach it, But brother. we do want to just Preach come it. to the table and negotiate. Preach Can it, brother. Can you meet us here? Can you meet Preach us it. there? Preach it. Preach it. The brilliant illustration of what we all go through. Yeah. And that's why I call this the career musician. Yeah. Because most musicians forget it's yeah. a career. Yeah. And you it have is. to treat it as such. Yeah. yeah. You, you do. can't just be like, oh man, I'm just happy to have a gig, man. You do. I'm Absolutely. Just blessed, man. Absolutely. No, 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 no. Absolutely. Man, you, you can't just be happy to have a gig. You you, you can't, man, because gigs, it's you can you can you can always get a gig, right? So so and this is my thing, even when talking to BJ, because BJ was really, really and still, I think. Yeah. You know. But I'm like, dude. It's just, it's just a gig, man. Don't you know? Don't it's put. So it's not the end of the world. That's right. Listen, man. When I, when I, after my run, right? I got a, I got my, my kids. You know, my son is going to like he needs me the most. He, so he's going to like ninth grade. My daughter's going to tenth, eleventh. So now I got to get ready for her college, right? Right. So now I got some money saved up. I got sure. some money stacked up, but that money is going to run out eventually. Sure. So I come off. I'm done on my faith. Man, let me tell you, that big house I had, is gone. You understand what I'm saying? I go and downsize, I already had, had, had another, like a smaller three bedroom that I had. So, got rid of the big house That's on the lake. Your common sense. Got, and, yeah. got rid of the big house on the lake, the, yeah. the six bedrooms in the house that yeah. I wasn't using, the upstairs that I never used, the, the backyard that I never went in, and it was either gonna be the house I put my daughter through college, let her live her dream. Or, or send her to a community college or a yeah. city college. Or I'm like, no, 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 no. We're gonna, I'm a, my life right. is gonna, I'm out the car business, I'm out the rim business, I'm out of all that business. You understand? Now it's a whole nother thing because I know my life, man, has been altered. But I do know that I'm gonna work my ass off to turn it around and make some of these dreams and some of these things happen within, you know, a short period of time. And I came off the gig. It was probably, Dre, probably, things is just now starting to manifest for me, man. Just now yeah, that, that's starting that, to turn. That's, that's and that's almost... Everything he said. Right there. Almost 10 years later, you know, the production has been incredible, man. It's been like, you know, I'm, I'm getting singles on the record. I'm seeing what, what real records look like and real checks from just having some singles on the radio. So can't live like I used to live because now you're living off the mailbox money. You're living off the, you know, but the bottom line is, is I'm seeing all this stuff turn around for me. And the thing about it is, here's the best part about it, bro. It belongs to me. DOA, I got to ask you. Yes, sir. A, a few quick questions. Yep. Number one, the internal chatter in your brain. Yeah. When it's speaking negatively, what do you do to shut it off or to, to, to deflect it? When it speaks negatively yeah. about where you like are in life, just self-doubt. <clears throat> yeah, where you, you are in you, life. You know what? You know what? It's okay. It's okay. Because we all go through that. Right. We all go through points of of where you're about to fall in, possible lightweight depression, possible, right. you know, like, like we, all, we all go through that. Right. We all go through that. But I think at the end of the day, I think if you're strong enough as a person, you it will automatically shut down. Because you know, man, one day you can be filling this whole thing, and then the next day it's just a, it just goes away. It's the curse of an artist, isn't it? It is. It yeah. really, really is. But only if you're a strong person. The weak ones can't take it. They lose it. They go under. They get help. They get medication. They go through all these things because mentally they're not strong enough 
to deal with these voices they had the negativity in fact I was talking to I was talking to somebody real close to me tonight same thing man I'm done I'm going to go get this 9 to 5 I'm going to go do I'm like dude no wait a minute no bro keep on eating the top ramen you know keep the top ramen going so persevere through it persevere through it I love it you have to you know and you brothers man just you know just meeting you Knowing this brother mm. for this, you know, this is our second time connecting. Number two. Oh, that's awesome. Right? But knowing him for several years and his strength and just what he's been doing and his uh, strong men. Right. right. You know, strong men to where if you let it, man, just, we, we, we talking about music, Doc. Right. We talking mm. about music. Mm. It ain't worth it, man. We doing that's music. Right. That's right. I don't need you to do music. You don't need me. I don't need you, you don't need me. He don't need you, you don't need him. You don't need him. So don't beef over music, because you don't need each other to do, beef over some other shit. He disrespected your mom and your wife, you know. Don't, I'm not gonna get in no beef over you with music. You gonna be my brother if we don't work together doing music ever. Right. Because I don't need you to do music. Now I may need you if you're the best mechanic to fix my motherfucking car. (laughs) I'm gonna try to keep some type of shit going with you. Like you or not, I, 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 you gotta fix my car, Doc. I don't trust nobody. But right. music, no, Dre, I don't. You, I'm not. Gonna, I love you too much. We brothers. Yeah, yeah. Music is not important. Separation. Yeah. Exactly. Because we all get it, man. We all get into that funk, man. We all get into that thing, you know. And I hate it because I see some of my brothers into it, and I've been there and still go there, man. Still, yeah. You know, you still, you still. You still go there. But it's self-examination, I think, is holding ourselves accountable to our own faults. Don't blame everybody for bad shit that happened to us. Look at ourselves and say, no, if I would have done this, the shit would have never happened. So why am I so angry? Or why am I upholding this dude? Why is it his fault? Let me, how could I, is there anything that I could have done different? And nine times out of 10, it always is. It is, yeah. So you should stop holding, I, yeah, I'm dealing with right now, I'm dealing with self-examination. I'm dealing with, you know, looking into the mirror, you know, defining who I am as a person. I'm, I'm dealing with um, letting a bunch of unnecessary stuff go. You know what I mean? I'm dealing with life is too short, you know. I ran into Jonathan, Martha, Jonathan at a, um, at a, re- a re- rehearsal studio. I can't remember which, which, which one. But he was talking to me. He says, man, congratulations, man, you're on this gig, you know. And I said, Jonathan, man, I got just one question. How do you, because at that time, Jonathan was the dude, yeah, man, yeah, right? Yeah. So I said, man, how do, you, how do you maintain this type of stuff? He says, from here on, from here on Derek, you're going to have to learn how to say no. That's how you maintain your value. That's how you maintain your value. Understanding the power of no. Understanding the power of no. And and trust me, there's no truer words. No true words. Man, when we got off of Janet, and I'll say this, when we got off of Janet, Johnny Gill called everybody because Johnny was opening up the show in Europe. And so when we finished the tour, Johnny Gill called everybody, the organs, Timbali, everybody who was in the band. Mm -hmm. Everybody who was in the band. He called me, you know, offering, you know, Money, I was like, no, nah, I'm good. I can't do it. No. And they don't. Can't do it. And they don't like being told no. They, they don't like being no. told no. Right. You write your own terms from that point. That's you say, right. this is what I need. Yeah. You know, this is what I need. But and now so, you just concreted yeah. your value. Now you just concreted your value. Yes. It's like a bully. You let yeah. them beat you up, they're not going to respect you. Absolutely. First time you kick their ass, now they respect Absolutely. You. Now they want to hang out with Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, there's a lot of cats from that era, man, that are doing really, really bad right now, man. Uh, they're, they're doing really bad. Yeah. You know, they're struggling. They're doing the $7,500 gig. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're struggling, man. And God bless them. I mean, it's like, yeah. but you know, there's ways that you protect that, man. And you don't protect that runner, running behind, you know. People, I tell people all the time, man, look, like when Lionel quits, if he was to quit today, where are you going to go doing a the, doing the job at your age, yeah, right. making that kind of money, money, which is great money in this climate and temperature, compares to a lot of other people. Right. But when that shit is done, what you going to do? What you gonna do? Who's going to pay you, whether it's five, 6000 a week or whatever it is? All right. Well, man, I really like the insight 
that DOA is putting forth here and how he frames everything. You really have to put things into perspective, you know? And I always say self-awareness is key. And trust me, I wasn't always self-aware. A lot of the people who know me listening to this podcast are going to be like, man, you're full of it, dude. <laughs> but please have grace with me because I've learned from my mistakes. I've learned from all of my experiences and it's a culmination of things that help us grow. And, you know, DOA tells us about his growth right here in this episode. So I really appreciate that. Hey, do me a favor, subscribe, leave a review, check us out, iTunes, Spotify, everywhere. Literally, The Career Musician is on all podcast platforms. And, you know, let's help spread the word and encourage one another. Until the next gig, if you've enjoyed today's interview, please leave a review and subscribe to The Career Musician Podcast. I'm just a nomad, nowhere man Writing the songs in this one-man band I know 